Hello and welcome to the Mindful Men Podcast, a show inspiring men to be mindful about their lives. Each week, we'll dive into a range of topics that matter to men and hear from everyday people doing extraordinary things. So if you love the show, please give it a five-star rating and share it with your mates. Now, before we get into this week's episode, please note that some of the content may trigger you. And if this happens, please reach out to your support networks. It's really important. If you can't get enough of Mindful Men, head over to our website. It's www.mindful-men.com.au. Find the show notes and the links to our socials there. But for now, sit back, relax, and let's get mindful. G'day, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men podcast. I'm your host, Simon Rinney. And today we're getting mindful about footy, mental health, and psychedelics. And joining me for today's discussion, I've got Brock McLean from Melbourne, Victoria. How are you going, Brock? Oh, good. Thanks, Simon. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on. Really pumped for this discussion. I'm, I'm a big footy fan myself. So anytime I get the chance to talk about footy, even though I live in, in Queensland, it's a good time. But Brock, to introduce you, you, you're a husband, you're a father, you're a mental health advocate and a psychedelic enthusiast, which I'm really keen to unpack today. But you're also a former AFL footy player with 157 games between Melbourne and Carlton. So quite the CV there. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's certainly a long time ago uh, now, AFL footballer. We're, we're coming up to nine years come sort of October, uh, November since, um, you know, my time in the AFL came up and yeah, 11 years goes past like that. So, but uh, yeah, the, um, the goalposts have shifted remarkably since then, as you mentioned, married now with a couple of young kids. Bonnie would be near, Bonnie will be two and a half next month and Camille will be 10 months in a few days time so yeah having two kids under two you know when Camille was first born was certainly a um, challenging experience and we're, we're right in the trenches at the moment but you know I absolutely love it I had the kids mostly one out to myself last week as my wife Steph was away in Brisbane uh, for work and then had some conferences when she came back to Melbourne so any chance that I can have with a bit of daddy daycare time it just fills my love bucket up and you know the two best things that have ever happened to me and yeah getting married to my wife a close second yeah I was just about to ask you about fatherhood because I do love talking about dads my kids are a six and three so we're a little bit ahead of you usually I have actually guests on who are a bit ahead of me so it's nice to have someone who's a younger dad if that can make sense (laughs) yeah thinking about you know, your kids and, and, and life before kids and then life after kids. Like, what does it mean to you to be a dad? Look, my wife and I never really spoke, you know, quite openly or never really planned. Like, in speaking about having plans to have kids and then, you know, we all found out we were pregnant with Bonnie at first and, you know, we saw it as a, oh, this is a sign, you know, this is absolutely meant to be. I mean, the, the odds were you know, stacked against us, not because of any health issues or anything like that. We were, you know, using contraception and, and those types of things. And as I said, didn't have any plans. So we just thought that was a, a sign from the universe that this was meant to be. And, you know, when we were pretty adamant with one and done. You know, it was like, you know, nah, we can, you can still have someone of a life when you have one kid and, uh, you know, you still tra- it's easy to travel because, you know, you've got alternating parents who can take turns of holding a baby. And then, um, you know, Bonnie came along and, you know, the, the whole birthing experience is just one of the most remarkable things, you know, as you well and truly know, as every parent knows, it's just, you know, the, the tears were, were flowing and, you know, just holding your baby for the first time. It's, you know, it's such a, a special feeling. It's something you can't really describe in words, you know, accurately. Words don't seem to do it justice. And then, you know, Bonnie becomes, you know, she grows up, starts to develop, becomes this, you know, this little human and, you know, you start to get interactions and smiles and talking. Uh, the, the more we got into that, we we're like, oh, we cannot really give her a brother or sister, right? Like that's extremely selfish, <laughs> you know, of us not to do that. And I think Steph had been back at work for a week or two and we started speaking about having a second, but we were like, no, we're, we're, we're going to wait. And I think Bonnie was 10 months maybe and we spoke about it. And then uh, I think the next day or the day after that, we found out uh, we were pregnant with with Camille, Steph was like, oh, I think I'm pregnant. We went up and got a pregnancy test and 
only a little one line came up. So like, I oh, feel, you know, we're in the clear, you know, we're not quite ready at that stage yet or, you know, you'll never exactly be fully ready. But And then she left the pregnancy test in the drawer and we came back to it the next day and there was a faint second line. And we're like, oh, well, <laughs> we, better, we better go and get another one. And uh, yeah, we did. And yet yeah, two strong blue lines came up on the test. So that's when we, uh, we knew we were going to have two kids under two and started hunkering down and, and preparing for that. But, you know, as I said before, just the greatest – the greatest gift that, that anyone can really experience in life and, you know, the connection that we have with our girls and, you know, we aim to spend as much time, you know, with them as possible. And I think that's probably one of the benefits of being an older parent and someone to have kids later in life. Like I've done everything that I've wanted to, you know, pretty much as a young person in terms of partying and doing all that type of stuff and socializing and, you know, I'm, I'm right at the point in my life, where I don't, you know, don't really, I don't want to do any of that. Every single spare moment I have in my life, I want to spend, you know, with my kids and, and really be there for them. And I guess, you know, my experience as a kid, you know, back in my dad's generation was very much secular roles, like the, mm. the, the mums stayed at home or they worked, but then they, you know, did all the washing, did all the cooking, did all the cleaning, looked after the kids where the dads really just went to work. They drank at the pub after work. They played golf on Saturdays. And, you know, I'm, I'm not crook or angry at my dad about that. That's just how things were, you know, at the time. That was the norm. But certainly I think there's been a huge paradigm shift, you know, in, in modern day fathers and them being so much more hands on. And that's certainly the case with me. And I hate being away from my kids, you know, for when I'm on a conference for work or, you know, for, for something that I might have to do from a, uh, a social perspective. Yeah. It's a, um, you know, so every chance that I get, it's, mm. it's time with the kids. It really fills up my love bucket. Yeah. Did you find stepping into parenthood easy thing to do or was it quite a challenging thing for you? Look, I've always been pretty good with kids. Like I'm a big kid myself, but I guess, you know, as everyone knows, when you have your first, it's like you get home from the hospital and you're like, well, what do, what do we do now? And, you know, your, your mindset is just simply don't kill the baby, you know. <laughs> so make sure that they're fed and their nappies change. But, you know, anytime you're doing hands-on work, you just learn so much, you know, as you go along. You make mistakes along the way, but mistakes provide the perfect opportunity for, for feedback and, and to learn and grow from those mistakes. So we're, we're constantly learning and, and growing as parents. And, you know, second time around, it's a hell of a lot easier. But yeah, it was, you know, and I guess early on as a dad, you can't really do that much with your kids anyway, like they're breastfeeding. Both our babies co-slept with my wife. We did a hell of a lot of reading around co-sleeping and looking at, you know, countries with high rates of co-sleeping and correlating that with the rates of SIDS and they were barely non-existent and just learning about how babies, you know, learn to do so much by being close to their mums, learning to breathe and learning to regulate their breathing and, you know, having that source of warmth and affection there and, and just how important love and nurture and affection is for a baby growing up. So, you know, I took on the role very early on of just doing as much as I could around the house in terms of helping clean, you know, helping cook do washing, folding, all of that type of stuff, you know. And then, and then once the baby got to, you know, to be on the bottle, you know, giving her the last feed of the night and then giving her the first feed of the morning so your wife can get a little bit extra sleep, you know, because they're, they're generally up through the night, you know, with the baby. So, yeah, it was just about, you know, finding as much that I could do to take the stress and as much responsibility off my wife's shoulders as possible. Yeah. Did you ever think like, I remember in, in the early days, like my son, he's the oldest, he only breastfed. He didn't have a bottle or anything like that. So I was often yeah. thinking like, when's my time to shine? Like he's yeah. so reliant on mum. Did you have similar experience as well with your first and then I guess with the second as well? Yeah. Well, I remember when Bonnie was born, she jumped straight on the boob and fed for three hours. You know, I was sort of sitting there like with the itchiest feet, just going, hurry up. I want to hold you. I want to hold you. And then she did her first poo like straight away, like when she was breastfeeding on my wife. So that sat there for three hours. So then my first experience of like, you know, any interaction with Bonnie was cleaning this like hard, sticky, like colostrum poo that had just like really gotten so entrenched into the skin that I was so scared of hurting the baby if I put any type of pressure on to clean it up, you know. So, but you know, that first experience of, you know, getting up early with Bonnie and giving her a bottle and then I would lie there and uh, I'm a massive NFL fan. So a lot of early mornings over the weekends and Mondays, the NFL was on. So I'd lie there and, and Bonnie would go back to sleep on my chest and I'd put a blanket over it and we'd just sit there for like 
a couple of hours and it was just the most amazing bonding experience. And, you know, if, if it wasn't watching the NFL, I'd sit there and I would read a book or I would just sit there and, and just be present in her presence and, and just being able to, to deeply connect with my child like that was was very special. You know, because that that was one thing that I was very, very envious of of Steph over was, you know, she had the the opportunity and the ability to connect with Bonnie, you know, so much more, you know, than the dad. So whenever I got the opportunity, you know, I, I, I grabbed it with both hands. Yeah. Well, it brings up so many memories of me those early mornings watching, yeah, I think Foxtel and these all these American TV shows and <laughs> and and just sitting there. I remember when my son would fall asleep. We dare not move. Yeah. <laughs> and so you could be yeah. there for three hours and, yeah. and it was just amazing, particularly yeah. given that I couldn't get him to sleep. So if he did fall yeah. asleep on me, I, I took every chance I could just to not you know, spoil that moment. Yeah, I learned, learned very early on to get comfortable first before settling the baby <laughs> on my chest because once she was asleep, that was it. I wasn't moving. Like, and if you're in the uncomfortable spot, that was a really painful two-hour experience, right? Not moving when sort of your back's out of line or your neck's in a funny position like not good for your body alignment at all absolutely but you wouldn't change it for the world like it was the best feeling at the same time even though it was excruciating yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah a, yeah so you, you mentioned uh, before like you know your parenting style now compared to say your dad you know and, and all that type of stuff and, and i'm keen to explore life before parenting because i guess it leads into your footy story as well so i'd love to hear a bit about you know where you grew up are you from victoria or did you move there and life growing up, and then I guess, yeah, what led you towards footy? Yeah, grew up a very blue collar family. Dad and his family, and his dad was a truck driver. You know, they worked in manufacturing or you know some type of trades. You know, for most of them, mum was a school teacher, and only just retired recently. She taught for like forty five years. So, wow. I have no idea how she did that. I used to do a two hour clinic with kids, and I was ready to pull my hair out. So, full full credit to her. And yeah, just you know, footy was always in the family. I mean, my pop played at Carlton. He played around a hundred just shy of one hundred and twenty games. I think played in two premierships, thirty eight and forty five. Was chairman of selectors at Carlton for a number of years. My uncle played VFL for Carlton and Richmond. His younger brother. My other uncle got invited down to Carlton as a 16-year-old and had all the ability in the world, but just he wasn't interested in playing at that level. He just liked playing local footy. Dad, from all reports, was a very, very handy footballer, was at Collingwood, trying out, did his shoulder in the last practice match, so required a reconstruction. And, you know, back then, a reconstruction was a very, very serious, you know, operation. He's got the sort of the butcher scar, you know, to show that. And then I think the following year or the year after, is it Essendon in the same situation? trying out, did his knee in the last practice match. So I think he was retired by the time he was 23. So there was mm. always, you know, football in the blood. And I think I always had a footy, you know, in my hands from pretty much a young age. I think I played Vic Kick at, you know, the age of four or five. And mum always tells a story that had to put me up a couple of grades because I was too rough with the prep <laughs> kids. So, and then I started playing competitively when I was six. And, you know, just like any kid, you just play you know, local footy, you don't really, you know, you might have sort of a, a pipe dream of, of playing in the AFL, but you're so young at the time and it's hard to really distinguish whether anyone at that age is going to go on to play mm. um, AFL. But it's probably not until, you know, the, the 13 or 14, you know, sort of mark when footy starts to get a bit more serious, you know, kids start to develop, they're going through puberty, they start to put on a bit of size and that's when footy starts to get a lot more competitive and challenging and, and physical. So, you know, I got to the point where I was, I think I was 13 or 14. I was, I was good at basketball and I was good at football. And dad said, mate, if you're, if you're serious about having a, a crack at, at making a professional in either sport, I think you need to pick one now and focus on that. And I, I always felt that footy was my, was my better sport and something that, you know, one that I was better at, but two, I had more chance of, of making it to the pros. And, you know, from then on, everything that I did in my life revolved around, you know, being an AFL footballer. So, you know, doing pre-seasons as a 14-year-old and, you know, getting up early over summers and, you know, avoiding, you know, going to the parties and, and drinking. And, you know, I was lucky I had a great group of mates who were very supportive of me and I, I didn't cop any peer pressure because they knew I had bigger goals in mind and, you know, got drafted as a as a 17-year-old in, in 2003 to, to Melbourne with, with pick five. So, yeah, as I said, footy was always in the blood. It was always someone that was, uh, you know, dad coached juniors, coached seniors, you know, when I was a kid, we were at the footy club, you know, pretty much four or five 
days or nights a week with training and watching the seniors on a Saturday and then playing on a Sunday. So absolutely loved footy and, you know, I'm still involved at a local level today. Yeah. Did you ever feel like it became a bit of a chore and that you're doing this grinding all year round trying to prepare yourself for an AFL career? Like I remember, you know, I played junior footy as well in Adelaide and at one point around when I was 16, so when my mates are starting the party as well, like I felt like it became a bit of a chore and then I, me and, and a lot of my mates who were really good at footy, we all kind of went towards the party lifestyle. Like, did you feel that draw or did you have enough discipline to stay away from that? No, I was very, very disciplined. I mean, Dad had, had sort of already planted a seed in my mind about him, you know, when he was coming out and, you know, he might not have been the most, you know, disciplined um, at times. So he said, listen, I'll never, ever tell you, you know, what you should and shouldn't do. and You need to make up your own mind. But this is what I did and this is what I wish I had done differently. Things that I, you know, absolutely loved and enjoyed doing was I loved training hard and I loved pushing my body, you know, to the extreme and I felt really comfortable in being, you know, uncomfortable from a training and, and fitness perspective, you know, so I'd, I'd happily train in 45 degree heat and happily go for a run when it was minus four, you know, I, mm. I really enjoyed, you know, that type of stuff. So I can understand, you know, how it might, feel like a chore for some people because some people naturally just don't enjoy, you know, Mm. doing those things and that's not, you know, a conscious decision. That's just, you know, how they're they're made up, you know, that's the way that it works. So I was always very lucky and very fortunate that that was my experience and my attitude towards training and and sacrifice and and doing what needed to be done to get to an end goal. And as I said, you know, all I wanted to do was be an AFL footballer and it was something that I was, you know, pretty much committed to. You know, every day since I was, you know, probably 13 or 14. Yeah. And what was it like being drafted? Like, it must have been a dream come true. How did you feel? Yeah, look, it was a, it was a dream come true. It was exciting. It was a, it was a relief, but in a way, it was the easiest part of the journey. Like, you've worked your bum off and like your whole career, you've, you've played against guys who have pretty much been only a, a year or maybe two years apart. From you, so you're playing well within a in a band of who your opposition are. But then you you know, seventeen year olds getting drafted. You're like, well, now I'm going to be playing against you know, twenty nine, thirty year old men who mm. have been in the system for ten or twelve years, very experienced, very strong, very fit. Like this is where the real work starts. So I was happy and and proud, but what, I was nowhere near content. You know, and that was something that, again, my dad had always been very very mindful or very old school in the sense of giving compliments you know mm. so even no matter how well i played or how good my game was it was always pointed out what i didn't do well or the things that i needed to work on and you know as a from a mental health perspective that did some real damage to me later on um in life but i'm glad dad did it to me because i wouldn't have been the footballer i was you know without it so it was one of those sort of you know double-edged swords Mm. Right, where it worked so well for me as a footballer, but as a human being in a mental health perspective, it didn't. But, you know, so as I said, happy, proud, but, you know, it was like, no, nah, I'm not content with this. I'm not happy with just being a draft pick. I actually want to be a, a really good player in the AFL. Yeah. So to talk us through the first few years and, and like settling into the AFL and into, I guess, what was the culture like? Being part of clubs is, is a fantastic thing, but it can be a bit of a sticking point as well for our own journeys. Like, yeah, talk us through the settling in and then and then growing in the AFL and then also, I guess, transitioning from Melbourne to Carlton as well. Yeah, I mean, it was a very daunting experience. Like, I remember going down first day of training and I, I walked through the club and I just had my head down and I walked straight to the corner and I fumbled around in my bag for the next 30 <laughs> or 45 minutes looking for some invisible thing that, you know, that... To everyone else, I was looking for something in my bag. To me, I just didn't want to look, you know, I didn't want to look up. I was so nervous, right? And, you know, I think that was a probably a bit more of the sign of the times, you know, back then. I think most kids walk into these days and they're, you know, they're pretty confident. They're pretty, you know, assured and feel like they, they belong pretty much straight away. Whereas back then, different sport, different time, different culture. So that was my, you know, experience on day one. And then, you know, the first year or two, my whole mindset is just about, just shutting up, saying nothing, and just letting my actions do the talking. So I'd always been a really, as I said before, really hard trainer, someone who, you know, liked to be fit, liked to lead by example through how I set the tone on the training field and how I trained hard 
every session and that was just, you know, my mindset and, and earning respect pretty much as quickly as I possibly could. And I, I think I did that in the first two years and, you know, you sort of, you, you establish yourself and, you know, you get a bit of a reputation as being a good trainer and a hard worker and a, and a good player. And, and then you start to come out of my shell, you know, a little bit within um, the playing group because you've, you've probably felt you've earned the right to speak up or to, to feel confident and feel like you are part of the senior group. So, you know, that was my initial experience at Melbourne. And then obviously, you know, further down the line, a bit of a hard run with injuries. And I got to a point where I felt like my career was going a bit stale at the D's. And I honestly, I felt unhappy. You know, at the time, I felt like that unhappiness was a source of my environment. But it wasn't until later on that my unhappiness was was truly entrenched with myself and being unhappy with who I was and, and what I was experiencing Anyone who's been in that situation knows that it doesn't matter what, how many times you change environments or how far you move away, those that mm. unhappiness follows you. And I got to Carlton with this idea of, you know, having a fresh start. And, you know, day one of, of training couldn't go on any better. I won the time trial and I'd, I'd been working my absolute backside off all of the off season. I, I trained as hard as I ever did in the off season, you know, and the coaches said to me on day one, it was like, mate, you couldn't have been more impressive. With that, you've, you've set the real tone for the rest of the group. And, you know, I breathed a huge sigh of relief. I was like, yes, you know, decision vindicated. I've opted for a fresh start and I've come here and I couldn't have gone off to a better start, you know. And then the first few rounds of the season, my form was really good. And then I broke down, I think, in about round five, just because I'd been training so hard over the off-season that I never really gave my body a chance to recover and recuperate. And, you know, by the time the season rolled, it finished up. I think I had both knees operated on twice and my ankle done one or twice, you know. So it was the absolute uh, debut season from hell for me and things snowballed the next year. But, you know, fortunately for me, I got back on the side, you know, for the last, you know, three years of my career and played some really good footy. And, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, football clubs are pretty brutal environments at times. They're pretty much a big business these days. And uh, I was told I was going to get a contract at my last exit meeting and then they changed their mind somewhere along the way and you know I got delisted by the Blues and you know that was pretty much the end of my career. Yeah what was it like changing from Melbourne to the Blues different clubs different culture how did you cope with that and then also yeah I guess that, that environment where does the mental health aspect start to creep in? I mean yeah look it was a they were probably in, in two different situations. Melbourne had gone through three really rough periods. I think last in 07, last in 08, last in 09. So we cut, we're probably on the up and up, you know. Um, they'd had a couple of lean years, probably three or four years before that, or you know, probably only that two or three years, and then had three number one draft picks in a row. So they're aside, they've recruited Chris Judd. Fabric was there, but, you know, the I got traded was that whole, um, you know, debacle on, on the footy show. So he got traded to Brisbane. So, but it was a team on the up and up. They were just finishing building their new $20 million facility, their training facility. And, you know, I'd come from, from Melbourne where, you know, the facilities were pretty much very ordinary, which, you know, was never a factor in my decision to go to uh, to Carlton. But going to a, to a place with facilities like that was like a breath of fresh air. So, you know, there were different sort of points in, the, in their football journey and, and where they were in terms of, you know, competing for finals. But a lot of the really unhealthy and toxic coping strategies that I'd be using the past sort of two or three years it had really started to build up to that point. And then, you know, obviously having that first year that I just displayed, you know, to Carlton, that was like a real turning point in that next sort of vicious cycle down from a mental health perspective. You know, drinking got worse, drug use got worse. The following year, the coaches asked me to lose some more weight. They thought that that would help with my leg speed, which I'd lost a considerable amount of with all the injuries that I'd had. And I was never blessed with a lot of leg speed to start with. So, you know, and then I became obsessed with food and obsessed with, you know, weighing everything and probably body dysmorphia and I developed lemia as well. So those are probably the two years where I'd gone backwards a hell of a lot from a mental health perspective where earlier into that was probably building to that point. And then, you know, those two years were the real catalyst for things to go a hell of a lot more pear shape. So yeah, looking back, it was, you know, pretty remarkable how I managed to do what I was doing on a weekly basis, uh, you know, for such a long period of time, you know, purging my food most nights, training hard every day during footy season, going out most weekends and, you know, abusing alcohol, abusing drugs and, and doing that was like a rinse, wash, repeat, you know, all season long. And, 
yeah, I don't know how you know, I managed to do that you know, because it was so tiring and putting you know this wall and this start up to your teammates every day. You know, particularly on those days when you're feeling really lousy and feeling like shit. You know, just pretending like everything was okay. That was extremely energy draining. Yeah, bulimia is not something that a lot of guys either own up to or has even talked a lot about. It's often associated with, we hear a lot of females doing it, particularly in the entertainment industry, and even young female, young girls, teenagers go through a lot of that type of stuff. But to hear a guy talk about bulimia is something that, I mean, still, it's out there, but it's not as prevalent. Talk us through that. Like, how did that show up or did you recognize that showing up? Or was that something that you didn't really tune into later down the track when maybe you got help or, or someone pointed it out to you? Oh, look, I, I, I knew it was an issue and I knew I had a really unhealthy relationship with how I looked at food because, you know, my challenges with depression and anxiety and the, having some really bad injuries at, at Melbourne and having time away from football made me realize that how precious football was and I didn't want it to be taken away. So I was just desperate to just do anything that I could to remain and I felt football because without it, I felt really worthless. You know, I had a lot mm. of self worth issues. So I knew that you know, I had an issue with what I was doing with the food, but because I was such a proud person and wasn't really, I didn't want to admit to anyone that, that what I was going through, it was just, it was hidden for so long. And I just continued to suffer through it. And then, you know, the probably the worst thing that could have happened to me in 2012, I, I got back into the team and I started playing. Like really well, like I recaptured my form. You know, I think I missed half the season in 2012, and I finished fourth in the best and fairest. And any elite athlete will tell you that I reckon in excess of 90 percent of them are extremely superstitious, right? So, whatever's working from a performance perspective, you just continue to do. So, you know, I just continued to do that over and over and over again because I was like, you know what. I'm struggling mentally, but I don't care. You know, that's not important to me because I'm back playing footy and I'm playing really well. And that's all I want to do, you know, with my life. So that became really problematic in itself where the best thing for me from a mental health perspective would have been, you know, if I was playing like really ordinary, it would have probably forced me to say, you know what, it's not actually doing you any good, mate. Maybe it's time mm. to, to rethink and readjust. But, you know, that wasn't my mindset because everything as a footballer revolves around your performance. Yeah. Was there any like sort of like health and well-being or mental health support in the footy clubs in those days or is it something that was very hush-hush? Oh, look, I think the the awareness was starting to become a bit more prevalent. You'd probably hear a few more, more so past players, talk about their mental health experiences. And the doctor at Carlton at, at the time, he pretty much knew that there was something going on with me and he offered me you know the opportunity to talk about anything on a number of occasions but you know just being that proud stubborn you know typical young male no i'm fine mate i'm fine you know mm -hmm. i just like a drink to you know unwind and and relax and you know so he knew that i mean i'm sure there were resources there like i don't specifically remember at the time but i'm, I'm sure they would have been there if i was you know willing to go and seek them out and you know and this is something that it's constantly debated within you know footy circles are players given enough support but it doesn't matter how much support or how many resources are actually there if you're not willing to actually mm. source it yourself and access those resources and it's all for nothing you know so the time that i did finally reach out to the aflpa and say you know what i'm really struggling i need to start speaking to someone professionally nothing short of amazing for me you know paid for all my psychologist appointments, paid for all my psychiatrist appointments, paid for both of my stints in the Melbourne Clinic, a private psychiatric clinic, which, you know, I reckon would have been somewhere in the vicinity of 70 or 80 grand, you know, mm. and without that, I, I wouldn't have been able to, to spend time in there. So I'm extremely grateful. You know, I think they've copped a lot of flack in the press probably the last year or two. And, you know, and that might be true of some people's experiences. I'm not saying that it's not. But in terms of my experience and how they were with me, I cannot say enough good things about them. I'm interested in to hear your thoughts. Like, you know, when we think about footy injuries, for example, and the media gets onto it and say someone's done their knee in for every day after that until they come back, they're reporting on the knee injury and so mm -hmm. forth. But over the last few years, and I remember Buddy Franklin had some time out of the game for mental health. 
And we're starting to see a little bit more of, oh, they're taking time away from the game for their mental health. Or they don't even mention the words mental health. They're just saying they're taking time away from the club. I'd love to see my personal view is that the media reports on, oh, he's having a mental health break or she's having a mental health break with the AFLW. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as someone who's played in the system and and experienced mental health challenges. Do you think that's a positive thing to normalise mental health or do you think there's a better way to do it? Oh, look, I think it's you know fantastic. I think the more we normalise it, the more it just becomes normal and it's not something out of whack and you know people say you know that's just like taking time off for being physically sick right it's just you know we go to a cardiologist when our heart's bad we go to an optometrist when we've got bad eyesight we go to a urologist when something's wrong with our you know when we're urinating so it's got to be the same for when we've got mental health issues it's no different but because of that stigma that's been attached Mm. to to mental health for so long there's still this apprehension you know to want to talk about it particularly with males, right? You look at the statistics, I think it's nine people are taking their own lives every day and seven of those are, are males. So we're heavily overrepresented in the numbers. We're heavily underrepresented in the eating disorder numbers because mm. we're not willing to admit that. But yeah, the, the more we normalize it, and the, you know, the more it just becomes, you know, part of the, the everyday conversation and people just don't say, oh, you know, that guy's taking a mental health break and, you know, sort of, you know, questions it or, you know, thinks it's 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 weak or something like that. He's like, oh, you know, he's just taking some time off to, to have a refresh and, and to get himself right. And I think the more players that do that, and I take my absolute hat off to every single modern day player that has done that, you know, Alex Solo, Buddy Franklin, Tom Boyd ended up retiring. You know, those guys are setting a tremendous example and really leading the way in terms of normalising, you know, what mental health is for athletes because there still is a massive common misconception out there that successful people in life, whether that's in business or in the arts industry or in the athletics industry, don't suffer from these issues and it couldn't be further from the case, you know, and I think mm. it's almost been brainwashed into us that money, fame, fortune, success – makes us all happy on a permanent basis and all those things, don't, they don't do anything for our happiness. They might provide brief hits of pleasure for a certain period of time, but, you know, if you're in a position where you're severely depressed and you win the lotto one day, you might get a bit of pleasure and a bit of a bump in your, you know, your pleasure for the next couple of weeks, but you're going to return to baseline at some point, right? So it couldn't be further from the case. Everyone, you know, no matter what your, your success, your job title, what industry you're in, there are always going to be people within those industries that are going to be affected by mental health. And it doesn't discriminate. Mm. And we need to promote that message more and more. You touched on before, like going into a private a mental health facility. As someone who works as a therapist in the system of mental health, like that's kind of very stigmatizing. It's almost like to the next level because you feel like it's like the jail for people with mental health conditions. I'd love to hear your experience of that in terms of how it helped you recover and still be with us today with the kids. I'd love to hear your thoughts on on that kind of support for mental health treatment. Yeah, I mean, some of the most amazing people and unfortunately troubled people I've ever met in my life have been in, in psychiatric clinics and, you know, some have been through at no fault of their own. You know, I, I heard this really, really great talking point by a psychiatrist by the name of Ben Sessa recently who does a lot of work with, with psychedelics. And he's like, it's amazing the amount of empathy we will have for a three, four, five, six-year-old child who's been neglected by the family, who's bounced around the foster system, who's experienced some type of assault, whether that's physical, sexual, emotional assault. And then those same kids grow up to be in their 20s. They've bounced around the foster system their whole life. They've been kicked out on the street when they're 18 because foster families no longer get financial support from the government and they turn to drugs or they turn to some type of criminal activities to survive. And all of a sudden our empathy dries up for those people. And you're like, well, hang on. You had it for them 12 years ago when their kids, they've gone through this horrible lived experience of not having a home, not having a family, not having anyone in terms of a social connection. And then all of a sudden you're going to think, you know, they're less worthy of love or less worthy of attention or empathy when they get to an older age in their life. Like It doesn't make any sense, you know, for me. And and being a psychiatric clinic really opened up my eyes, you know, to that. I've always been an empathetic person. I've never had any trouble with that. But when you actually take the time to sit there and listen to these people and actually listen to what their experience has been growing up, you sit back and you go, there is no wonder you are the way that you are and Mm -hmm. you're having the issues that you're having. You know, so I think... Judging people from afar when you've had no understanding, no empathy, 
no idea of what someone has gone through or the experiences that they've had in their life, you know, because you haven't gone through that. That's, I think, where society needs to do a hell of a lot more, yeah. you know, work on. So being in those environments, yeah, I, I totally understand. You know, when I first went in, you, you know, I was like, oh, God, you know, there's a bit of a stigma attached to these places. But, you know, once I went through the experience, I met the people, I did a lot of the work, cognitive behaviour therapy, you know, acceptance and commitment therapy, art therapy, you know, going through all of those group therapy sessions, I was like, you know what, I don't care, it's a stigma attached. These things are really helping me. I'm learning a lot, but, you know, I'm not getting better in the space. You know, I'm not getting from being completely depressed and being fully healed, you know, in three weeks or five weeks or two months. It is a bit of a journey on the road to recovery, but, you know, these things are really, really good for me. If there's a stigma attached to that, then I didn't care. You know, I, deep down I knew it was helping me and, and that's all I wanted. Yeah. I know that when you finished your career that your self-worth, because it was so heavily attached to footy, really took a dive. At what point did you get help for that? And how do you see your self-worth now being, I guess, a dad and a husband as well? Like, do you think it's on the mend? And what have you done in the, in the process to try and build that self-worth up again? Yeah, I mean, I remember listening to a, um, to a podcast. It was a woman by the name of Kristen Neff, who seems like a real guru in the world of sort of self-worth. And very early on in the podcast, she spoke about this concept of sort of self-esteem versus self-worth and what we teach our kids about self-esteem. And, you know, self-esteem relies on, you know, you have a higher self-esteem because you're, you're really good at something or you're, you're extraordinarily good at something. You might be an amazing athlete, amazing dancer, an amazing singer, really good at math, really good academically. You've got a high self-esteem, right? But that teaches kids who, who might not be extraordinarily good at something. They might not be mind blown at something. They might just be ordinary at things or just okay at things. You know, so that, that while well, they don't deserve, you know, any self esteem because of that, the world teaches you that not everyone can be extraordinary or not everyone can be super amazing at something. So transferring, you know, from talking about self esteem to talking about self worth, self worth teaches you that no matter what you're good at, no matter what you're bad at, you're a human being and you're worthy of love. And the, and the most important thing in life is how you are with your friends, how you are with your family, how you treat those people, how you want to be treated by those people, how you treat complete strangers and other people in the world and how much you spread kindness. You know, so that was something that I really had to unlearn. But, you know, any learned behavior can be unlearned. It just takes time and work and effort and therapy. And that was like a real breakthrough moment, you know, for me. And she also talked about in the same podcast, it was like, you know, there are a lot of people who struggle with self-worth. They might identify with these things. And I'll never go, I won't go into specifics, but hearing that, it was like, this huge relief because I could stop blaming myself for, for being like that. I put so much untoward blame on myself. Like, why are you like this? This is your own your own fault. And, you know, you've got no one else to blame, you know, but yourself. So it was, that was almost a time where it was just like, you know, permission to say, hey, it's, it's not your fault. Like, it doesn't matter whose fault it is, but it's not yours. It might not be anyone's fault, but now you can stop blaming yourself and actually just start to move on, you know, and start practicing and putting things in place and, and start to – to really believe that, that I'm a human being and that I'm a good human being and that I'm worthy of, of love and I have worth. It was really trying to see myself through everyone else's eyes who were closest to me because they told me those things for a long, long, long time. I just never believed them. Yeah, I love that. Like just that sense of, yeah, seeing yourself through the eyes of other people. Like that's amazing. It is. And you talked a bit about acceptance and commitment therapy before, and I've practiced heavily in that in my therapy practice. And it is that. It's accepting things for as they are, but then committing forward with some, you know, values and that self-worth and, and being okay with not being okay. Like it's an incredible thing. And I think that kind of leads into your mental health advocacy as well, because you're so open about sharing your experience and that can help show everyone that they can live with challenging situations and still push through and still be worthy of love and friendship as well. It's a testament to you coming forward and sharing that story. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing that probably stood out for me for acceptance and commitment therapy was, you know, we, we were sitting there talking as a group and we're talking about the emotions that we experience and then the actions that we use to try and deal, we, you know, with those emotions. And it was like, you know, it's not the emotions, it's not the feelings that it's the issue, it's these actions, right? Everyone in life experiences these emotions. They experience sadness. They experience anger. You know, they might experience depression, loneliness from time to time. And th those aren't the issue. It's what we do to try and avoid those emotions or blunt those emotions or suppress those emotions. And, you know, the really 
emotionally strong people are able to just sit there with those emotions and, and process them, knowing full well that eventually they will pass, whether that's in an mm. hour or two hours or a day or, or two days, they will pass. And that was one thing that I really, really struggled with was processing difficult emotions and learning just to sit there and be with them and accept them, but mm. knowing full well that at some point they would change, you know. So that that took, you know, quite a number of years for me to fully get mm. my head around that. Yeah. I'm interested now in like in psychedelics because you you do talk a bit about that on, on your um, socials as well. And I always like to have a variety of guests on the show to share that mental health treatment is not just going and doing CBT or ACT or talk therapy, essentially. You, you can trial different things. You mentioned art therapy before. There's music therapy. There's animal-assisted therapy. Talk us through psychedelics and, A, what got you interested in psychedelics and have you used them in your own therapy journey? Or, yeah, what can you share for us in terms of the benefit for mental health? I, you know, God, how long ago was it? It was maybe five or six years ago. And I just started talking about it with a couple of mates. And I'd, um, I was talking about their experiences on ayahuasca. They'd gone to, to the South American jungle, basically, in Peru and did a, an ayahuasca ceremony for, for a couple of weeks. And I was talking about their experiences. I was like, mate, I really need to learn more about this. So they recommended me a couple of the books. The first book was a, a book called How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, which I reckon a lot of modern day psychonauts, you know, that could have been their, their first book that they read that got them into the, the psychedelic ecosystem. And that's certainly the case for me. And then the next one was a book called The Fellowship of the River, which was about a, a doctor who was doing his MD training who had sort of, he straddled both philosophies in terms of a, a Western worldview philosophy and an Eastern worldview philosophy because of his upbringing. He grew up in America, but his parents were South American. So I just, I started reading about psychedelics and I was just immediately hooked and I felt like I could understand and retain a lot of the, the information just based on my own experiences and based on my own feelings and, and what I had, had gone through. And it was probably the first time since I finished playing footy that I'd felt like I'd found my little niche. Mm. It felt like I'd found my, you know, my, my calling or, you know, or my place in the world, you know, after footy and, um, from then on, I just I was just reading and reading and reading and reading, reading as much as I possibly could, like reading books, reading articles, reading studies and, and research, even though I didn't understand a hell of a lot of the, the science, you know, components. Just didn't, I didn't have that training, but, you know, slowly learned as I went along. And then, you know, just, you know, learning about what sort of current mental health pharmacology actually what does to our brains and what, and what it actually just treats right it, you know the antidepressants antipsychotics they're really just treating symptoms you know and mm. developed this thought line that was like well you know imagine if we did that for our physical health right like imagine you know we go to a cancer doctor and we say you know what i've, I've got a tumor and you're like you know what we're not going to cut your tumor out we're going to you know get a brain tumor but here's some panadol there for your headaches here's a face washer run it under cold water when you get you know hot flushes and I just thought, you know, we don't apply that logic to physical health. So why are we doing it to our mental health? So looking at the psychedelic research and what it did seem to suggest in a lot of the participants and a lot of the people who were going through these clinical trials was actually getting to the source of their issues and are now allowing them to, to work through those issues and look at their depression or their end-of-life anxiety or their PTSD in a completely different life. And the one study that comes to mind is the phase three for MDMA for PTSD. And 67% participants no longer met PTSD requirements two months after their, their treatment. And these are people who had like dissociative PTSD and had it on average for like 14 or 15 years, which is wow. just absolutely remarkable. So then you start looking at these things as, as potential Q-based treatments. It's not the same in everyone's, you know, situation. And I think mainstream media need to do a better job of portraying that and stop putting it in such a golden light because it's actually setting people up mm. for failure. But, you know, that was my first initial foray in the reading about psychedelics and I've just, you know, be, just become extremely almost borderline obsessed just about its learning and getting involved as, as much as I can. Yeah. Have you given it a go yourself, like in any type of psychedelic assisted therapy? No, look, I, I haven't. I'd love to. I 
when was it? 2020, I had plans to go and do ayahuasca in Peru and then COVID happened. So travel got kiboshed and then we gave birth to Bonnie, you know, later that year. So the good thing is my brother-in-law is getting married in Brazil next year. His father-in-law is Brazilian and his mother-in-law or future mother-in-law is Peruvian. So I'm at some point, probably prior to the wedding, I'll, I'll get over to Peru and I'm, I'm really keen to explore ayahuasca so i still think that i do have like a, a lot of emotional hangover and emotional baggage just from my experience in my childhood and i'd love to explore anything that's in there to, you know to further promote healing and, and insight and even just exploring altered states of, of consciousness that's just become really fascinating to me as well so there's certainly that and then maybe even post that there's a um place in brazil where they do five meo dmt retreats which is essentially called you know the god molecule and i'm really keen to explore you know that experience under the under the guidance of, of professionals and and you know exploring different parts of, of my psyche and, and altered states and, and just again learning as much as i possibly can and, and, and seeing what's out yeah is there much of a, I guess, a pathway for this type of treatment or support in Australia, or do you have to go overseas? You mentioned Brazil a few times. I mean, those those are all sort of the, the ayahuasca experiences in, in the South American jungle are all sort of shamanic rituals, and these are things that have been pra- practiced by Indigenous cultures for, for, for thousands mm-hmm. of years. So tapping into the Zen knowledge, again, that's that Eastern you know, philosophy and something that I'm really keen to explore because I think the most optimal place to take psychedelics is it out in nature and with mm. people who have understood it as being passed down traditionally through their, their family heritage or their, through their lineage. And these people have, you know, one hand on, I guess, Mother Nature, you know. So I'm really keen to tap into that. But, you know, the, the things are slowly starting to shift, I think, you know, culturally, politically, the psilocybin for the treatment of resistant depression and MDMA for PTSD were just down scheduled here in Australia. So from July 1, anyone with treatment resistant depression will be able to access psilocybin assisted therapy from an authorised prescriber and likewise for, for MDMA for PTSD. If you look what's happening in the States, the MDMA for PTSD could be approved, FDA approved as, as early as by the end of this year. There's been a lot of money invested into private and public companies. There's a lot more research going on into, into different molecules now like DMT, which is much shorter acting than psilocybin and MDMA and 5 dmt and non-hallucinogenic molecules. So, you know, companies are exploring the taking, the, I guess, the trip out of psychedelic substances to see if they're, they're more suitable for, for people who've got harder to treat conditions like Parkinson or Alzheimer's or, you know, even um, uh, stroke victims as well, looking at fibromyalgia. They've had great success in treating using psilocybin for, for patients with end-of-life anxiety, which is some type of terminal illness. So, yeah, the, the, it's still very early days and there's a lot to work out in terms of structural issues, infrastructure issues, scalability issues. You know, it's not like a a tablet where you can just take every day at home and go on about your day. Like you have to sit there for eight hours with two trained therapists. So that that becomes Mm. challenging in itself just because of the cost of the therapist's time. I think some of the numbers that have been bandied out already for for MDMA-assisted therapy could be anywhere between ten dollars and $20,000. And if you're not getting private health insurance companies to be able to pay that, then, you know, how do people access that? Especially people who have had severe mental health issues. You know, a lot of them don't have that type of money around because they haven't been able to work or they've been severely affected by whatever their predicament is. Well, I think what will happen over time is once we start to collect data, once these therapies become legal and accessible, then we'll be able to produce some type of cost-benefit analysis where you'll look at when someone commits themselves to a hospital, I think that costs the state maybe $13,000 or something like that. So if you can say, well, right, oh, this treatment costs $15,000, then over two or three years, it stopped that person going to hospital mm. four times or it stopped them, you know, checking themselves into a public psychiatric facility or whatever the case may be, you know, you might be able to start extrapolate some numbers and say, well, it's a high upfront cost, but over four years it saves us fifty or $60,000 because we know the cost to, I mean, the Australian economy, there was a, a report done a few years ago, it's like $220 billion a mm. year in lost productivity and to GDP. So those are pretty stark numbers. So I think once we start to see some longer-term data in terms of what we can actually save 
from an economic perspective and what we can start contribute to the economy in terms of loss production and more people in the workforce, healthier population, a happier population, then you know, you might start to see governments and the private health insurance step in and say, you know what, we'll pay the upfront cost because over the longer term, we're, we're saving so much. Yeah, it's also savings because you're not having people in hospital beds and so forth, which beds are pretty few and far between, particularly after COVID. We re- really recognise that during COVID. But also it creates economies because you've got new therapists coming into the space and, and new providers as well of, of the psychedelics themselves coming into the space as well. Seeing a lot of that in the medicinal marijuana space at the moment, as that's becoming more and more normalised across the world, you're seeing a lot more providers coming into the space and training up and selling stuff as well. So it kind of it decreases the impost of mental health, but also increases the, the economic viability across the board as well. It just gives us more tools for treatment. Mm. You know, not, not everyone's going to respond to psychedelic therapy. Yeah. I'm not saying psychedelics are a pan of cheer, right? They are extremely like powerful substances and people have to do a lot of work to get to the bottom of their issues. So they're not going to work for everyone, but they might work for a subset of the population. And traditional antipsychotics and, and antidepressants, you know, might work for those people. So they still continue to do those. But it just gives physicians, psychiatrists, doctors a much more wider breadth of treatment tools, which, you know, might make a huge difference in treating a subset of the population that haven't been, you know, treated well by the traditional you know, pharmacological treatment methods that we that we have seen over the past 20 or 30 years. Yeah, absolutely. And I always talked with guys, it's around horses for courses. So what might work for me might not work for you. And that depends on, on every single modality and medication and, and so forth. So this is just, yeah, as you said, another tool for the toolkit, um, which is going to be really valuable going forward. But Brock, I could talk to you all day. This is a really exciting and interesting topic also around the, the mental health as well, because it's really important that we continue to normalize these discussions. If people want to to find out more about what you're doing at the moment and, and in this space, where can they find you? I don't really promote much of the stuff. You know, I do I just do a bit of ad hoc stuff, you know, so I'll, I'll do some talks for, uh, for footy clubs, for schools. I did one for Wyndham Vale Council last week. So it's just about, you know, depending on the time of year and, and, and availability. But, I mean, I have done some stuff on um, – ABCs, you can't ask that. I was on the Channel 10's The Project talking about my eating disorder. I opened up, you know, really publicly for the first time on the Sacked podcast via the, the Herald Sun. That was with John Ralph and Glenn McFarlane three years ago. So those are probably the three big ones that come to mind. But, yeah, you will um, – anytime there's a psychedelic conference on or, or, or anything in the in the news around that, you'll probably find me glued to the computer or, or glued to, uh, you know, whatever – Source is, uh, is promoting that, mate. That's generally where you'll find me these days in between managing two kids uh, under two and a half. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Brock, I'd, I'd like to leave every episode with my guests plugging something that makes them feel good. So it doesn't have to be necessarily anything to do with mental health. It could just be something that's lighting your flame at the moment, what you're watching, what you're listening to, anything that's making you feel good so that our audience can maybe tune into that same thing and feel good as well. Yeah, look, I mean... At the moment, it's um, I'm just starting to get back into a bit more of an exercise, you know, a routine, a bit more of a a reading routine, just be, a bit more of a routine itself. Just because, as you know, it's kind of hard when you know you have a, have a couple of young kids and mm. sleepless nights, and you find yourselves, you know, getting out of those good habits that you know really contribute to your physical and mental health. So today was the first day that I started to get back in a routine. I was like, you know what? doesn't matter how tired you are through the night. You're going to get up at five. You're going to take the dog for a walk. You're going to come home. You're going to meditate. And then you're going to get into the rest of your day. And it's, it's already had a massive impact on on how I'm feeling and, and my productivity as well. Because I think starting the day by doing productive, you get that dopamine hit and then it makes you, you know, motivated, continue to be more productive as well. So, you know, I think that's as good an advice I can give to anyone is, you know, get into a really good routine. And, you know, I think what you touched on before about horses for courses, find what works for you. you might um, require a bit of trial and error and tinkering with a few different things, but get to a point where you, you've got a full range of tools in your toolkit that, that you know works for you, that you know you're going to have uh, maximum benefit from. Yeah, absolutely. Perfectly said, mate. Thanks again for coming on the show and sharing your journey. It's been really insightful to hear, hear your story, but also some of this stuff around the psychedelics and really appreciate your time today. Cheers. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for today's episode and I hope you got some value from it. 
If anything triggered your mental health today, please reach out to your support networks. Also, if you love what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your mates. For more from Mindful Men, you can check us out on Instagram and YouTube, and I'll throw the links to these pages in the show notes below. But until next time, stay mindful. Thank you.